Good afternoon and welcome to the DCRI Research uh, Conference. Welcome uh, to those of you that are joining us through our, our, our streaming, which I understand is, is up and running th this week. And just as a reminder that we, we archive all the DCRI uh, conferences. So for those of you that like to, to review, uh, which I typically do every, uh, every week, and for those who don't have an opportunity to join us, you can always turn to, to the archives. I thought uh, today would be particularly fitting after Rob Califf's overview last, last week, and we wanted to focus uh, more on the DCRU, uh, the Duke Clinical Research Unit. So with us today is uh, Barry Mangum. Barry is the, the director of the cl clinical pharmacology in the DCRU. He is an associate clinical professor in clinical pharmacology at the medical school and also an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics. So Barry is, is here to give us an update on the, uh, the DCRU. Barry. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Um, many of you know me, and many of you know that I'm a walker talker, okay? So um, I, I have this sort of bad habit of going off on tangents. I have 46 slides today, and we're going to save some time for you guys to ask questions because this is an important topic from my perspective because, as I was telling Rick earlier, that uh, seven years ago today, I was interviewing for my position here with Dr. Califf, Dr. Harrington, and Dr. O'Connor, and the first topic out of their mouth was, we want you to help us build a phase one unit here at Duke University Medical Center. And I'm like, why? Why would you ever want a phase one unit here? And it was like, well, phase one leads to phase two, and phase two leads to phase three, and we're really the world's largest ARO, and we think that that's a great idea. And I said, wrong idea, totally wrong idea. So I was expecting them to throw me out. But it was, unfortunately, it was a snowy day. And I remember looking out Bob Harrington's window on the seventh floor, and it was snowing so hard I couldn't see across the street. And I said, Bob, you're my last interview today. I think I need to leave. You know, and he goes, okay, cool, you can leave. And, oh, by the way, we want to hire you. So here I am uh, seven years later, and we have a unit. This is not my unit. This is not anyone else's unit except your unit. And I want everybody, both the streaming people as well as the people in this audience and every audience that I talk to from this point forward to understand that this unit is Duke's unit and it's meant to be used by you. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you kind of an update. I'm going to give you a little historical overview. I like to bring a little humor into my talks because... You know, we all need some of that at the first of the year, especially just before tax season. So um, so what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to give you a little bit of an overview and uh, hopefully some update on what has transpired, how we are, where we are today, and what this means uh, to you guys. So, so what is phase one and why do we even care? Uh, by the way, if you guys want to get in touch with me, you know my name. You can just Google me into your uh, your Lotus Notes, if that works today, and uh, see if we can uh, you can get a hold of me. So, what what happened in 1906? Well, in 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act came into being, and this was medicines for the 19th century containing dangerous substances. Now, I show this slide a lot when I talk about pediatrics, because I'm a pediatric clinical pharmacology guy, and my area of special interest and, and probably expertise is in neonatal medicine, but this is a real product. It's called Mrs. Winslow Soothing Syrup, and I don't know how many of you uh, are from North Carolina or anywhere else in the country, but if you ever were out in the country, your grandmother probably gave you something called a whiskey nipple or a whiskey tip for your teething, you know, and if you, how many of you have kids? All right, so how many of you ever used a drug called paragoric? Anybody rubbing their gums? Yeah, sure. It, it's not on the market anymore. Uh, it, it kind of fell off. But this is a very similar product, except this drug, and this was the advertisement. I got my hand over the thing. This is the advertisement for children teething, greatly facilitates the process of teething by softening the gums, reducing all the inflammation, and allaying pain, spasmodic action. So if you know if you've got a kid who's teething, you're going to have a spasmodic colon. And it's sure to regulate the bowels. It depends on its mother. It will give rest to yourselves, you know, <laughs> to the mother. That doesn't mean the mother has to take a swig of it, okay? Although she probably did. 
you know, uh, and relief and health for the infants. So, some of you don't sleep well at night. This might be a good drug to take, okay? Except this drug contains alcohol, morphine sulfate. It caused coma, addiction, and death in infants from respiratory depression. This drug was something you could walk into any apothecary, any pharmacy, and buy off the shelf, okay? So in 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was instituted, and there was a guy by the name of Wiley who was the first commissioner of the FDA. And so this is what precipitated, again, a safety issue in doing early phase drug development, and specifically in children. It caused a, a real problem. Along in 1938, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act came into be being as a result of President Roosevelt signing this into uh, law uh, in June of two 1938. And this was to firm up the FDA's new drugs were to be safe. How many of you in here know how many drugs were approved last year under the Obama administration? Okay, and then how many of you know how many drugs were approved under the Bush administration? Anybody know? Come on, you get this is a bi-directional flow of data. Okay, <laughs> so I got the IT guys in the room, but I want you guys to tell me how many drugs were approved last year. New drug, new, new drugs, new drugs approved. Twenty-six. How many of them the year before in the Bush administration? Zero. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Democrat, by the way. So, <laughs> so there were 25, actually. There's, there were more biologics approved this, this past year than ever before in the history. And we're going to see that shift go forward. But my point is, is that the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act went into play in 1938 for the safety of drugs. Now, which one of these characters... Which one of these characters is Dr. Caleb? Okay. This is the humor part of my talk, so it'll get over pretty quickly, all right? Because Dr. Caleb's not here to defend himself. He may show up. I don't know. But anyway, so we took a little poll before you guys came in, and there are three early risers here. The three early risers unanimously picked out someone. Who would you say is Dr. Caleb in this crowd? This guy right here? This guy. That one. Well, everybody else picked this guy, okay? But either way, it doesn't matter. This is the first FDA, okay? This is the first group of FDA, and they were called the Crusading Chemist because these guys went out and actually did audits, you know, out in the, in the pharmaceutical industry and shut a lot of people down. So, again, this is the first FDA. Just a back, little bit of history. Now, let's get into some of the drug development stuff. We here at Duke are involved in a fair amount of pre-IND work. Many of you, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a novice here, so I found that it's, uh, this is an unbelievable wealth of knowledge of people here developing drugs in the labs in the pre-clin space here at Duke University Medical Center. And again, this was the impetus behind the development of the DCRU, the Duke Clinical Research Unit, which is a phase one proof of concept unit that takes drugs out of the preclinical domain and actually looks at the dose escalation and the initial PK work. We currently have a study and uh, working in the area of psychiatry right now that we received the GO grant for, which is an amazing technology that we can actually treat and possibly cure methamphetamine addiction. And so we're going to take this drug combination that we've managed to come up with here, it's not me, but others, and I'm a co-PI on this project, but we've taken that and we're going to take it to first in man and do a dose escalation, and we're actually going to do an initial PK because we need to understand when the drug peaks. So we're going to do the pharmacokinetic analysis, then we're going to jump right to a phase 2A trial, and we'll do a proof of concept trial in first in human subjects as well, in this case, first in methamphetamine addicted subjects here in, in Durham County. And then obviously you guys understand the phase 3 domain. How many of you work in DCRI? Almost everybody? 
Yeah. So you guys are used to cardiovascular mega trials. You're used to all this other sort of stuff. You know, John's been doing rheumatology work and immunology work with us uh, over the years, uh, last year and a half or so. But that's not. We're not going to be in the phase three business in the DCRU. We're going to be in phase one and phase, early phase two proof of concept work. So these are just some numbers for clinical purposes and how much time it takes to do get a drug through market. In phase one, it's about 12 months. Phase two is about another 26 months. Phase three is about 33. So a total of 72 months or about six years to get a drug through its paces to an NDA. These are just average numbers published in 2003. And the average cost back then was about $802 million. Uh, and the clinical cost is about $450 million. I throw this slide in because I wanted to point out a couple of things, and that is the plethora of early phase drug development that's out there. Many of us go, okay, well, we get involved when the pharmaceutical industry wants to come to us and we want to um, engage with them as a consultant. Uh, I've done it, and many of you have done it. Uh, and they come to us and they do what I call selective brain robbery. They come in and they take your knowledge, your expertise, and your space, they pay you money, and they say, see you later, we don't get to do the work. Well, that's going to stop because we want to do the early phase work. And if we look at the number of NDAs filed in a number of clinical trials, we'll just take Viagra, uh, sexual uh, erectile dysfunction drug here. There were five, uh, took five years to do this drug, uh, 42 phase one trials, 13 phase two trials, 13 phase three trials for a total of 68 and over 6,000 subjects. So there's a lot of this early phase drug work going on that we in the past have not had a play at, but we're going to change that paradigm. And if you look at Vioxx, you see a similar type thing. They did 31 phase one trials, two phase twos, and 13 phase threes. Again, we've been focusing way over here in our business model in the phase three work. Okay. So why do drug development fail? Unsuitable pharmaceutical properties of these compounds, uh, unsuitable clinical PK, pharmacokinetics of these drugs just don't fit. Uh, the pharmacology doesn't work in humans. It might work in a mouse or beagle pup, but it doesn't work in the human model, so we can't really carry it forward there. And we see unexpected toxicities encountered in the early phase drug development world. I'll give you an example. There's a drug we're getting ready to work on now. We are, are, actually are working on it. This drug failed in the cardiovascular arena. It failed because of hepatotoxicity. It failed because the dose was too high. And so, but one of the things they found, and John, you can correct me on this, one of the things they found in this new startup little company was that when they looked at the data, they saw that the uric acid levels in these subjects was zero. So now we take a drug that was touted to be a cardiovascular drug by Big Pharma, and they shelved it, and now it comes back to life as a uricose uric drug, okay, a drug for gout. And so we're doing that study, so we'll start that study fairly soon now, but the dose that you don't get the hepatotoxicity at, we will never exceed for gout because we think it's going to be really low, and they've done, already done their phase one work. We'll be involved in their phase 2A work, their proof of concept work, uh, here fairly shortly, probably in March of this year. So the academic value proposition for us here at Duke is leadership position, discovery of pathways through probing of biologic targets, what I call systems biology. This is where really the goody is. We need to understand how these drugs work and where they work at the subcellular level connect discovery scientists with clinical investigators, novel approaches to drug development processes. I'll tell you that this is a passion of Dr. Kalos and a lot of other people, is how do we change the paradigm of how we do clinical research? It's, you know, we've always done it this way. It must work. It's got to work this way. No, that's not true. We need to look at new ways to investigate the data, and we need to look at new ways to do drug development in this country to expedite that 25, 26 number of drugs approved every year because we're going to see a plethora of biologic compounds coming our way from the biotech industry. The opportunity to work in early phase stage work, this is key to us here, getting in early, bench-to-bedside philosophy, 
serve as a platform for leading edge studies, grant funding, NIH. We've gotten two stimulus grants already based upon early phase clinical pharmacology out of the, uh, the ERA GO grant process. We, were, we had some of the best scores, if not the best scores, in the, the GO grant process for this early phase work. And Jeff Ginsburg uh, and Dr. Becker were recipients of one of those looking at aspirin therapy. And that's a fascinating little story to tell you, but I won't tell you today because of time commitment. But we're going to be doing, and we are doing, the normal healthy volunteer and the inpatient in subject uh, study with that, uh, along with the methamphetamine study I mentioned earlier. And then obviously we want to publish out of this data set. So, this, you can't see this very well. It doesn't show up on these monitors because of the lighting in here. But this is the first look at the unit. Okay, the unit opened December 15th. We would welcome you. If you have not been to, and, and I'll, I'll challenge you, how many of you know where the unit is? A few. Okay, great. Most of you don't know where the unit is. You know, Chris knows because Chris Karsak, because she put the artwork up in there, right? Um, among other things, I must say, Chris has been a real godsend for everybody here at Duke. But the, the point is, is that you need to come and see the unit. You need to see what you have at your fingertips to deal with because it is quite a fascinating 30-bed phase one unit on, on third floor, yellow zone, A elevators of Duke South. Okay? That's, that's a mouthful, but come and see it. Knock on the door. We won't let you in unless you want to be a subject. Uh, but no, uh, and we, we actually have a study going on right now that's a 16-day confinement study. That's a long time to stay in the in the phase one unit, uh, over two weeks in the unit. And so I'm going to show you some other photos. This is uh, our um, this is our recreational area. Uh, we have you know DVDs. We have computers. We have the capability to uh, play uh, all sorts of games. We, have, we don't have a Wii in there. Anybody want to donate a Wii? For, we need a Wii in here, but we might, might get into problems with hurting people with that if we're playing bowling or tennis or something. But, but this is kind of the, it gives you kind of a feel for the expansion of the place. We have a rec area, private reading rooms for those who are not so interested in co-mingling with other people. Um, you know, and, it, and it's true. I mean, you, you, I've traveled to most all these phase one units around this country and in other parts of the world, and people don't like being with other people, you know. I mean, although they're going to, if you go back to this sort of, this picture, you'll see that there, we have three rooms in each bed. Every room has window access. We have a patio access, so you can go outside if you want to. The only thing you can't do is smoke. We don't allow smoking there, Okay. Uh, but you can go outside. You can. I, I have what I call the Shashevsky basketball arena outside on the patio. You know, we're going to put up a basketball goal out there. But uh, all said, th those are some of the pictures, and we would welcome you to come see that. So, what is our mission? To provide a unique model for the conduct of early phase clinical research and the development of new medical therapies. And you can read the rest of these. These slides will be posted. But the point is that we need to get to the bottom of understanding how drug development works and how drugs work, and, and we'll utilize this unit to do that. You've seen this picture at nauseum. You understand it, I'm sure. Dr. Kalis probably given it to you more times than you want, and he's a, he's a wonderful guy for having all this stuff, this vision for creating this sort of thing. But we set under the Duke Translational Medicine Institute umbrella. Uh, as a Duke Clinical Research Unit. The DTRI, the Duke Translational Research uh, Institute, we get handoffs of uh, therapy here uh, over to us, and then we hand those off to the DCRI. That's the goal. The goal is to translate it from bench to bedside to standard of practice, and we hope that we can play a, a vital role in that, and I'm sure we will. We already are. Our scientific focus is to discover pathways for probing of biologic targets, uh, developing novel biomarkers, using the omics toolbox, if you will, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, to actually foster this process forward. We have a pedigreed patient population here. How many of you in here know how many subjects are in the Duke database? Any IT guys here? No. No, this, this, is, this, is, this is the denominator. You have to know what the denominator is before you can actually go and pick out 
These are CHF patients. These are myocardial infarction patients. These are, you know, whatever. So how many, how many total denominator subjects do we have here? It's quite impressive, actually. Four million. Four million. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We got four million in the data set. And I didn't say they were all alive. <laughs> so there are four million people in a data set. We, we have information on four million people. And there's, there's, a, there's a very interesting, and we'll get to that in a second. Let's see if we can go here. Well, obviously, we have a state-of-the-art unit and a high, highly trained staff. Uh, in our research toolbox is the omics of or we talked about the IT bioinformatics platform. This is a fascinating place to play because we have some new tools here at Duke called Deduce and Discern. And Deduce is an understanding of big network of who's out there, but Discern is a software package that was developed by Jeff Ginsburg and the group in OIT where we can actually look at those subjects where they're going to be on a daily basis with certain disease state populations, okay? And most of our work in the DCRU, I'd say 90 to 95 percent of it, is going to be disease patient-oriented work. Let me give you an example. We're getting ready to start a CHF study with uh, Mike Felker. And this is a, a company, a gentleman has created a whole new chemical entity whole new class of drugs, and it's going to be for left ventricular heart failure and congestive heart failure. So we're going to be the first to study this drug in congestive heart failure subjects by this company. That drug study will start sometime at the end of March 1st of April. This is a fascinating opportunity for phase one trial with this new chemical entity. It's a small molecule. It's not a biologic. So those are the types of cutting edge technologies we'll be able to utilize, and then we'll utilize certainly the heart network data set as well. Uh, and hopefully the results will get some signature responses and non responses to toxicity as predictions of what we're all about here in the, in the data integration piece, and then we'll publish out of this data set as we go forward. So the DCRU overview and experience, I won't bore you with this. We have 20 years of GCRC work. Now, let me stop you here and ask you a question. How many of you ever worked in the GCRC here at Duke? I know a few of you have. What are the barriers? What does the pharmaceutical industry say is the barrier to entry to come into Duke to do work other than the DCRI? I'm just, I'm just teasing. Now, what is the barriers to entry here? What are they? There are four of them. What are they? You can tell me this. I know you can. IRB is number one. Okay, so how long does it take to get us through the IRB process here at Duke? How many months? Four months, three months, two months. Well, two months is too long in phase one because the study will be done. Okay? Four months is just forget it. We're not even going to talk to you. What's the second barrier? Intellectual property, right? We have to own some of the data sets so we can publish out of all sorts of stuff. Okay, what's the third one? Contract. How long does it take to get through contracts at Duke? Three months, four months, forever. So RB and contracts are big showstoppers. And the last one is probably cost. No, probably about it is cost. Okay. So how do we take down those barriers? And I'm going to share those re way we did that here in a couple of seconds. Hold those thoughts. Therapeutic areas of expertise we have here at Duke, these are all the ones that we have. Many of these we're already doing clinical phase one work in, uh, and many of them yet to come to bear. I just met with Dan George in oncology. We're getting ready to start a couple of projects. As a matter of fact, we've got a client call this afternoon at 4 o'clock to deal with a new uh, chemical entity that they need, they need, the company needs an ADME study, absorption distribution metabolism excretion study done in early phase oncologic study patients. We can do that in our unit. We have over 800 faculty here at Duke uh, as members of the therapeutic team. Uh, we will obviously offer this. This is, again, your unit. You utilize it. Uh, we want participation of all Duke faculty and, as experts here and then have direct access to patients with disease states. Okay, this is our pediatric. We have two units. We have a pediatric unit and we have an adult unit. The pediatric unit is L. Rankin unit. It's the GCRC. It's been retooled. We have six pediatric confinement beds there, and you go, K 
kid, well, hang on a second. How many of you in here have kids again? Everybody? Okay, so I'm expecting all of y'all to put your kids in the clinical research studies we have, right? No, you're going to go, oh, this, this isn't happening. Um, can children be in clinical research phase one trials? Is that possible? Why? Why is it possible? We have, we have like 10 studies going right now. So why is it possible? Well, parents can stay with them. We have, we have these 10 beds, licensed hospital beds, that patient, parents can stay with the kids. And we also have confinement bed studies. But we will do phase one, true phase one PK studies in kids, but they won't be normal, healthy, volunteer kids. There are no normal, healthy, volunteer kids. Why? It's an ethical issue. It's unethical to do that. Now, have we had pharmaceutical companies come to ask us already, would we do normal, healthy, volunteer kid studies? And the answer is, yes, we have. Uh, and what we tell them back is, call the FDA, because we're not doing it. You need to deal with the FDA on that. That's not our, our gig. We will not get ourselves into trouble in that sort of venue as an ethical problem. We have an outpatient facility. We have infusion capabilities, and we're doing that work now uh, in oncology and others. We have a metabolic kitchen. We have specimen collections. We have an investigational pharmacy, and we have 24-7 security. When you enter the new unit, you will not be allowed to leave that unit. Okay? You are there. Okay, so if you come to visit, I expect you to go to the PK Draw Lab and get your samples done. No, I'm just teasing with you. Um, but the adult unit, we have 17,000 square feet on the third floor. 30 adult confinement beds. You've seen some pictures. It is attractive. We have five exam procedure rooms, 700 square feet of to conduct specialized procedures where we need pulmonary function tests or exercise equipment tests or stress tests. We're going to do uh, left atrial. We've got a study that's coming to us that's a left atrial filling pressure study looking at echocardiography. We will do that study here in our 700 square foot flex space. Subject recruitment and screening, we have, that, we have three recruiters on board now. We'll probably add more later as we get busier. These are the types of studies that we uh, have are marketing ourselves to be able to do certainly PKPD, some biomarker studies, DDI, drug drug interaction studies, thorough QT. This is a space where we want to go, and we have some studies slotted that, of interest that will be coming uh, in the thorough QT business. I will tell you, and I think I have some slides down the road, I'll tell you now though, that we have a fully validated 12 lead. EKG telemetry system that's wireless, okay, and it's on both floors, all right? That system has now been um, validated for the throughput to the core research facility here at DCRI. And so now we have a seamless integration. No one in the United States in the academic arena has this capability, no one. And not many people in the pharmaceutical industry have this capability. Uh, so we'll get to that in a second. Other operational capabilities, project management, biostats, data management, randomization. We're working hand-in-hand -hand with DCRI on data management and biostatistics and other areas. Um, and we'll share resources as we need to as we go forward. Contracting, this is what I mentioned earlier, where the, the problem child lies in those four venues. So our turnaround, by the way, we outsource our IRB, and we have a special dispensation from Duke to do that. We outsource to the Copernicus Group over in the Research Triangle Park for all IRB submissions for industry trials. So what is our turnaround time for doing that? I know the slide says two weeks, but what is our turnaround time for industry-sponsored IRB submission turnaround? How many days? You can't say, Corey. You already know. What is it? Give me a number. Four days. <laughs> What were, you, what were you drinking before you came in here? <laughs> you know, you must have been smoking something. I wasn't smoking last night, but no, I'm just um, It's 9.3 days. We've been me measuring that metric for over a year and a half. We know that we can get it down to seven days, but I can't tell you that. I'll tell you that 
it's two weeks. We also run parallel the contracting process. We do all of that, and we do the contract and the IRB submission in parallel, and everything is done in a two-week span of time. Okay, so and the, we CDAs and MSAs, we do those within 24 to 48 hours. Okay, and we have a dedicated lawyer for us in Gil Smith's office that we work with. Okay, so that's how we can do that. And we have a dedicated team at Copernicus as well that does only our RV submissions. Uh, emergency response capabilities, you can read this. We, we have all the above uh, hospital-based unit stuff. Uh, volunteer recruitment of the database, we've already touched on this, but we're building another data set of our own. Uh, in the triangle, we have over one and a half million people, and we will be building uh, not only a normal healthy volunteer data set, but also a disease-specific data set. Uh, again, to mention that we have a 12-lead EKG data capture real-time uh, interpretation here, and this is just a picture of our Matara system that we have. Uh, it's quite sophisticated. Um, we have the capability to do echo MRI. We have one of six in the world uh, to do echo MRI, and it's a machine that was given to us by a sponsor. We're maintaining it and carrying that process forward for metabolic studies. Uh, again, state-of-the-art digital EKG. Uh, we have all the other pieces, parts that you would expect to have in a fully integrated, fully validated phase one unit. This is our lab uh, facility. This is our uh, processing unit. Uh, we have refrigerated centrifuges, t minus 20, minus 80 freezers, uh, certain a lot of lab space. We have draw space for any of you who want to give blood, you can come over and give. Uh, we'll put you in our data set. Um, I'm actually looking for OGTT, uh, oral glucose tolerance test subjects now, so you'd be more than welcome to come over and sign up for that. Uh, lab capabilities, we do not do any analytical work. We outsource that to LabCorp, and we have a strategic partnership and a master service agreement with LabCorp to do that work. Uh, but what we do is we spin, decant, freeze, store, or ship all the samples that we have. And we can do that. Um, and again, these are more of our lab capabilities. We have master agreements with various vendors. Uh, pharmacy capabilities, we have full service pharmacy capabilities in the unit. We utilize IDS pharmacy, but we have our own pharmacy and our own pharmacist on staff now. Uh, and uh, everything is temperature mapped and controlled. Technology cores, immune monitoring, omics, cell therapy, imaging, all of these things we interface with. As I said earlier, we're doing a functional MRI study that's coming up uh, in March or early April. Uh, we'll be doing more in the world of imaging as we go forward and working out our strategic relationship with the guys down there. Uh, we have our DCRU is a GCP compliant area, uh, and we have all the comprehensive SOPs now in place. Uh, we're Part 11 compliant in our electronic data capture component. We're building that unit now, uh, and actually the uh, uh, senior programmer from the UK is here for the next two weeks helping us with our electronic data capture system. These are some of the personnel. Uh, I won't bore you with this too much. You know John McCutcheonson. He's the program director. Uh, Bob Novak, you do not know. Bob is the medical director for the DCRU. He's an MD, PhD with 35 years of experience in clinical research, as well as uh, academic uh, uh, interests from LSU. Uh, he's done over 100 clinical trials, uh, obviously me. Kathy Lavin's the operations director. I think you guys know Kathy from previously working here. Uh, Vivian West is our senior project leader. She has 12 years of clinical experience. Uh, Shane Chow is our biostatistician uh, and has over 20 years of experience, and this guy if you give him something to review, you're going to get back about five pages of answers and questions from him, but he's really good. So what is our future direction? Uh, I'm going to finish up a little early so we can actually uh, have some questions Q&A. We are creating a global network of proof of concept units. That global network is going to encompass Singapore and India. Singapore is a 30-bed unit, fully outfitted now. India will be a 60-bed unit. Uh, and that will be a joint venture between Duke and uh, the India group out of uh, a company called Medanta that's been formed. This is a joint partnership. Uh, and we'll have then a triangulation of capabilities to do clinical phase one proof of concept work 
that no one else on the planet has other than Big Pharma. And I don't know how many of you have been following Big Pharma lately, but Big Pharma is getting out of the phase one business. They're selling their units off. So BMS is sold off, Wyatt's gone, Pfizer's getting ready to divest, AstraZeneca's going out of the business. So the list goes on and on and on. So we're going to see probably a lot of outsourcing in this space, specifically in early phase disease oriented subject populations. Ability to evaluate pharmacogenomics across ethnic diverse populations, as I've already mentioned, looking at not only uh, India and Singapore, but China as well, and harmonization of operational processes and IT systems across all these units. We've already laid down the primer, the platform for that, uh, and it's moving forward nicely. We're increasing our efficiency through economics of this scale and unparalleled toolboxes and currently in discussions with potential other partners uh, moving forward. So what makes DCRU unique? The combined efficiency and operational capabilities of a commercial unit with up-to-date biological insights for academic medicine, and you can read the rest of this, Ac access to special populations and hospital-based unit. This is very key to our success. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to take questions. I've got about 15 minutes or 10 minutes of Q&A. So ask me any question you want uh, other than how much it costs to work in our unit. I won't answer that. So, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Barry. Nice, uh, nicely done. A very comprehensive uh, overview. I'll, I'll start things, things off. You mentioned that this is Duke's unit, right. uh, and you certainly have presented in that fashion. What is the DCRI are you doing to get business that then, and in turn? We could have investigators like Chris and others in the in this room. What is your business development plan to get uh, those types of projects here? Our, our business development plan is twofold. One is there are two partners in this deal. One of the partners is you, the investigators, and I'm serious about this because if I alienate you as a partner and you, let's say you have a, a company that comes to you and says, I, I've got a phase one trial and I want to do it, and you say, yeah, that's great, we want to do it too, we'll just take it to the DCRU, we have to operationalize that with you as a partner. That's key. So being and educating the PIs that are here or sub-I's that are here is vital. So that's one piece of it. The other piece is that we are reaching out to big pharma and biotech uh, now with web presence, new brochures, meeting presence, and a variety of other uh, opportunities that we'll be out there with to let the pharmaceutical industry know that we are here and we're serious about this business model. So that process has started now. You will see a new web page being launched or new web presence from DCRU being launched soon. The brochure is being finalized, the new brochure. We had an old brochure, but since we have a new unit, we need a new brochure. So the new brochure will be finalized within probably by the end of this week and will be out in a couple of weeks, I would hope. Um, and then you'll see a kind of a gala grand opening with Victor Zhao and Dr. Califf and others uh, kind of making the big splash that it's here now. Uh, we had to wait until this time to make those announcements simply because of people's schedules. Dr. Zhao, Dr. Califf, they're very busy people, as you might expect, and getting those two guys in the same venue is a little challenging. So uh, that's coming. I can't give you an exact date, but I think it's the 1st of February. So we'll see that sort of announcement coming out. So we'll be making a kind of a splash at that point. Um, so from a business development perspective, I know I'm going to be out uh, with Danny and other Danny Benjamin and others to recruit business into the DCRU. And by the way, Danny, I just uh, have an option to go to Pfizer to get their, all their phase one pediatric business. So uh, they've called us and want us to come and do a presentation and I'll be glad to go and do that. But the point being is that that's the sort of thing that we need to do. We need to educate people, basically. Uh, questions? Uh, Chris. Chris. About which projects are in kind of aligned with the mission of the 
of the unit. Of course, all of the phase one work done around the world, there's a huge amount of that is just kind of rote yeah. um, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic work that, that probably is not well suited to what we want to be doing. Um, and, 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 and kind of attached to this question is one of the economic questions. I can't believe that we can do this as efficiently as a group in England who just has a unit out in some farm where they can, well, well, that's where this work is done, right? Where yeah, they can yeah, do yeah. this very efficiently. So there must be some premium there cost is. also. There is. If you could give us an idea about that. And then what, presumably these should all be projects where there's some faculty member who's interested kind of in future development and ultimate clinical application. Is that? That's exactly right. And you're hitting all the, all the hot buttons. So let me, let me give you a, a paradigm shift. The FDA is, is shifting their emphasis away, not just from first and human PK feed and bleed. We're not going to be a feed and bleed shop. That, that's been made clear to everybody. We will not be what I call the rope feed and bleed, let's herd the cows into the corral here and stick them and bleed them and feed them. We're not going to do that. We will do some of that only as it leads to first in patient populations. 90 to 95 percent of our work will be in first in patient populations. What I mean by that is the FDA is now moving the pharma company away from saying, well, okay, your drug worked really well in the normal healthy, you know, 18 to 45 population, but what happens when we take it to the real population? Now, let's don't wait until the end of phase three or phase four or late phase study to find out that we got a Vioxx problem, right? Let's find out that problem early as we can, and so let's take it to the first in patient population early on. We'll call that a phase 1B study, all right? So phase 1A would be feed and bleed. Are we going to do that? No. Quintiles, PPD, Park Cell, there's a gazillion people out there. There must be 150 of these units hanging around. And to your point, there is a unit in the U.K. that's out on a farm. It's called Cambridge. Okay, and so uh, that's a GSK facility, and GSK has approached us and said, you know, we really need complex studies done in the next five compounds in type 2 diabetes that we're going to develop, and we can only do it in certain places. Our SOP says we have to do it in a hospital-based environment. Where is the hospital-based environment in the United States? GSK did away with theirs. Okay, so they have Cambridge, which is at Cambridge, and they have potentially us. And so they want to develop that sort of relationship to carry that forward in hospital-based patients. So to your point, I was saying earlier, and I wasn't joking, we need to develop a data set of oral glucose tolerant tested type 2 diabetes subjects. And if we had that, that's a goal mine to do that work. So to carry that process of that product forward, so Mark Feingloss, in endocrinology is very interested in getting in the game early, understanding these new treatments for type 2 diabetes, and being able to carry that through to his patient population, ultimately as an NDA-approved drug. Does that kind of help yeah. you? So we will not be your normal healthy volunteer feed and bleed PK shop to do this work, nor will we be an analytical lab doing this work. The analytical components, it's too expensive to do this. Unless you guys want to step up to the plate and manage all this. Pfizer, just to point this out, Pfizer spent $60 million building their unit at Yale. Okay? Now, that unit is in question as if they'll stay open another year. Um, they're not doing very well. And they're having real difficulty in the state of Connecticut recruiting the subject-based populations they need to do this work. So where have they reached out to? RTP. Now, you'll be shocked to know that when we were at Park Cell, we discovered something unusual. I asked the Park Cell recruitment manager, I said, so tell me where your patients come from. They come from Baltimore, you know, Hopkins or, you know, D.C. He said, no, 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 no. They're coming from New York and RTP. I said, really? So what's up with that? And he said, well, it's $207 Southwest Airlines flight, direct flight to, to Baltimore, 
and subjects come here, they make $7,000 for a week's confinement or $5,000 for a week's confinement, and they fly back home. And they're coming from your place. And I'm like, oh, really? Be back here. So, um, you know, I'm like, this is interesting knowledge to me. But those are the feed and bleed people. Those are not the people we're after to work with. Yes? Uh, why is uh, it sounds a little bit you're opposed to the bleed and feed? And I would think it has two dangers. One, uh, or it has one danger and one opportunity. So the danger would be. The opportunity first. No, I'm just <laughs> but, so, uh, I think the danger would be if I can, if I as a company can get someone who does the complete set, yeah. I would go for them. So I think that's the danger. Yeah. And the opportunity is for all our research. Uh, aspects, you sometimes need healthy volunteer control populations. And that is something you would probably only be able to tap into. Okay, so let's, let, me, let me answer that, and I'll tell you that we're getting ready to start a study that is exactly as you described. It's uh, in anesthesia, okay, with Mark Newman's group and uh, David McLeod. And this is a normal, healthy volunteer comparators trial for PK purposes, not even PK, they're doing pharmacodynamic uh, data collection here, looking at a drug that's going to be similar to propofol, okay? And it's got to be done in normal healthy volunteers first. And then once we pass the normal healthy volunteer stage of this, getting this pharmacodynamic endpoint down, we'll take that to a phase 1B study in a PK population based that, that we may or may not. I mean, these are this is an OR type scenario, so it could be disease state or not disease state, but they'll take it to a normal healthy volunteer PK study population at that point. Now, again, I'm going to reiterate, this is not our normal, this is not going to be probably our bread and butter, but i got to tell you, we've got to keep the lights on too. And so we've got to make some level of denominator, I'll call it financially, to keep the place operational. Um, we, our biggest problem here at Duke is overhead of people, and uh, we have to run a fairly lean, mean operation. That's not to say that we don't. It's just that we're, we've got to work towards that. So to your point, I, I think that it is an opportunity, and it could be a downside, but I look at everything as an opportunity because we have the capability to do the normal healthy volunteer population. We really do, and we're doing that with the aspirin study, actually. We did that earlier to get the money to do the GO grant for the NIH stimulus package. We did that as a normal healthy volunteer. I think it was 100 subjects in that trial. And you would be surprised at how many, how many students here at Duke and UNC and A&T came over and said, hey, sign me up. I mean, yeah, I'll take 100 bucks and, you know, you got to get one blood sample from me and I'll take some aspirin for a week and, or two or three days or whatever it is. I can't remember the protocol, but it's, it was easy. It's those... That was an easy but very foundational study that you're going to see publish, publication after publication after publication. So these things can lead us into other things that we want to do at the NIH level. Okay? And we do both NIH and, just like DCRI, we're going to do both NIH investigator initiated work as well as industry responsive work. I don't want you to walk away from here today thinking that we're just going to do all pharmaceutical industry and that's all we wed to. It's not. It's your unit. We want to utilize it for you. And we're doing a fair amount of that already. We really are. I can't give you statistics. Yes. My interest is in oncology and most of the investigators are currently running their phase one studies through the oncology treatment room. Right. Is the plan eventually to have all that work done at the DCRU? That would be my plan, uh, but that's not probably the plan of everybody in the, the phase one. You're talking about Herb's group? It's Herb's group. It's, it's Dr. Hurwitz and Dr. Friedman and, yeah. you know, it's breath, lung, all of them are doing yeah, phase all, all one of work. Them. I, I will tell you that we will be your resource when you want us to be your resource. Um, we've gone through about a year of fighting with the hospital to get the infusion piece of that work over to us so we can take off some of that stress off you. Um, again, it's your unit. You do what you want to do with it. Um, we're there to help you. 
but with some guidelines, of course. But the answer to that question is we're doing oncology phase one work already with you guys. And we want to make that partnership a real partnership. It's not about cutting people, not about encompassing other groups. It's about working as a partner through this process. We're, we're doing Vicki Seewalt's um, Coleman breast cancer phase one study. We'll, we'll do that. And I'm working with Vicki strategically, Bob Brady here, uh, working with Vicki and MD Anderson to make that a reality. And um, it, it's difficult. These things are not easy to do. Mike, is that me or? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'll go to the next. I'm going to the DCRU and broadcast and everything. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, last question, please. I was just curious uh, along those same lines um, if the studies that are being done at the DCRU up to the early phase two, is it more likely to then um, get handed over to the DCRI for the later phases? It is. And, and that's the, the complete intent. I, for almost seven years in Willette knows, I, I've been working in DCRI and pediatrics, okay? And my area of, of interest and opportunities here has expanded over the years to work in the early phase drug development uh, and trying to make all those things happen. So there needs to be a communicator between DTRI, DCRU, and DCRI, okay? I, I kind of span that domain. So yes, the answer is DTRI hands a project over to us, or we hand a project to them. Eventually, they hand it over to us. We operationalize it in the early phase work. Once we get past that, we would hand it over to DCRI and say, have at it, phase 2B and phase 3. That's where you're going to really shine. You're the experts. We're not. Go at it. That, that's the goal, is to make this nice, smooth transition across all boundaries. Okay, well, thank you. Barry, very I want to thank you very much, and thank you all for attending. <laughs>